to the important part of this segment, Rachel Leninger. So, all right, before I introduce you formally, I'm not going to embarrass you this time, but I remember the very first time I met you because I remember how excited I was when I first saw Rachel's name pop up on our listserv because I saw not only another female, but a female in Minnesota contributing to the list. And I thought, oh my gosh, I have a kindred spirit right here in my own community I didn't even know. Would you believe I had to go to Seattle to meet her? So I met her in this bar in Seattle with the other Syriconers ahead of the other Syriconers. And I walked in, and do you remember this? I'm like, there was this whole group of people, and there was like this one guy there. I won't mention his name because I don't want to embarrass him, but he was like a guy that people were following around the whole conference because he's sort of a superstar of information security. He like goes way back and everybody knows who he is, right? And so any normal person would have gone in and gone to him and gone, oh my gosh, you're here. I went straight to her and I go, it's Rachel, you're Rachel Lininger, oh my gosh. And everybody was like, what? <laughs> so anyway, that was my introduction to Rachel and she's become a friend of mine. I really enjoy her. And one of the things that I think you're gonna enjoy is this presentation because this is gonna be a departure from all the other stuff. This is an opportunity to, to think about how we are as people and not so much data and it's I think the really great thing about this too is it's based on your original research and um, so take it away Rachel and we're gonna enjoy this thanks Is this better? Yeah, it's much better. Yeah, good. OK, now you can hear me cough, too. It'll be great. So I'm here to tell you why we can't have nice things. And um, this is me. I can't t actually tell you who I work for because they don't like it, and I, they didn't actually have anything to do with my research anyway. So my little consulting company is Three Letter Associates. Instead of practicing for the past couple of weeks, I've been sick. So please do not tell Toastmasters about my notes because they will kick me out. So the information security field is pretty notorious for having trouble getting along with management, with the business, with IT, with each other. It's a thing. There is a lot of conflict. And as our own Russ Thomas says, why is it that InfoSec community debates so often devolve to circular firing squads? You know, we kind of have a problem. How many of you have been to a security conference that had to talk about getting along better besides this one? Okay, how many of you have been to a security conference that didn't have one of those talks? So, not all that many. With all these problems, it's easy to forget that conflict isn't all bad. The opposite of conflict is not harmony. The opposite of conflict is groupthink and dumbass decisions. <laughs> My basic argument today is that, is that we don't need less conflict, we need less stupid conflict. So how many people here have encrypted their email at some point or another? PGP, GPG, whatever. OK, now, keep your hand up if and only if you're sure that you've always done it correctly. You never compromise the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of your messages. You never hit reply and sent an unencrypted response. Um, you didn't lose a key. You didn't trust a key from a source you didn't validate appropriately. You didn't autocomplete the wrong person's address. There's no problems with dates or with versions of PDP. Is anybody's hand still up? Yeah. And if it were, I'd ask you to keep it up if you're pretty sure the people you were talking with also did it all correctly. And if anyone's hand stayed up then, I don't think I would have believed them. And now I have one more question. How many of you have told someone that they ought to encrypt their email? Yeah. So encrypted email has been around for a long time. PGP was developed in 91. We've had this software for over 20 years. It's one of the bedrocks of our field, and we can't even use it ourselves. But we still insist that other people ought to be doing this. There is a right way to do things. We insist that people do them that right way. And if they can't, then I guess they, don't just, they just don't deserve to be secure. Even if we're not able to do it right either. There are a lot of things like this. My password hygiene pretty much sucked before 1Password. 
And I know a lot of others, I know a lot of you all have that same issue. Before password managers, it was all the same. Here's an example a little closer to home. I bet a lot of you have similar stories. A couple of years ago, I went to work for a company that will na remain nameless. I was supposed to do a little risk program for a subsidiary of theirs. And under the direction of the previous contractor, they'd done a risk ass assessment of their environment. It was 800 pages. There were over 1,000 low risks. The guy had come from a multi-billion dollar medical device company. The subsidiary had maybe 100 million, 200 million in revenue a year. They weren't high, highly regulated, and the uh, head security guy had been promoted from ops last year. They didn't have the tool for this. They did everything in Word and Excel. It worked about as well as you can imagine. My favorite that I remember was the uh, risk that the website could be defaced, and the appropriate remediation for this was upgrading Active Directory. <laughs> I never did understand that. Um, that they also missed a lot of really obvious threats that you could infer from reading about them and reading the rest of it, but they just missed them. So what happened here? What happened was that my predecessor knew the right way to do things, and he was going to do them that right way, no matter what, regardless of whether they had the tools for it, whether they had the ability, whether it made any sense whatsoever in context. There was once a bank, not the one I can't say that I work for, but no, actually not that one. But by policy, they forbid punctuation in web forms. This was a noble effort to um, prevent cross-site scripting and SQL injection attacks. It meant that every free text field on a web form needed a policy exception. I think you can imagine the sort of fights that happened with that. Business was lost because they couldn't do free text fields without a fight. I saw this kind of thing all the time, and sometimes I did it myself. When I went to all these talks about how we don't get along, I never felt like I learned much. This wasn't the fault of the presenter, really. It's just the advice they gave wasn't useful to me. It basically all boiled down to have better social skills. If I could have better social skills just by being told, I wouldn't have kept going to those talks. <laughs> I wanted to understand better, so I went back to school. I got a master's degree in organizational leadership, or as I like to call it, remedial office politics. I took a lot of courses on negotiation and conflict resolution, and I discovered I was really bad at it. Um, I am qualified to mediate and arbitrate for the state of Minnesota. It looks really cool on my resume. Don't ever ask me to do this. I'm bad. <laughs> Excuse me. You know. More than once, my partner and I were the only people in the whole class who would fail to come to a resolution on a role play. It's a role play. We couldn't make a deal. And the problem was me, OK? <laughs> um, my professors were baffled by this because it's kind of unusual in the first place. In the second place, when it does happen, usually it's because one of the parties is really competitive and aggressive, and other people just refuse to deal with them. I'm not really all that competitive or aggressive or whatever. I'm just really, really stubborn. And um, it wasn't that I didn't want to, to deal. It's, it's that something was not the right way, and I wouldn't do it. The problem was with my approach. So I wondered if this were a general problem in the field, and there are tests for um, finding out what approaches someone prefers. So my final research project was to compare the conflict resolution style preferences of information security personnel with the general population. So let's talk about these different conflict resolution style preferences. Pretty much everyone in the literature talks about this in terms of two axes. How much you care about what the other party gets versus how much you care about what you get. You can call that assertiveness versus cooperativeness or um, substance versus relationship. You get the idea. And I do want to be clear about something up front. It is not that there is a best style or a worse style. Different situations demand different styles. The problem is that if you tend to overuse or underuse one of the styles, 
you cause problems for yourself. If what you like to use is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you don't have a hammer, then everything starts looking like rivets or screws or staples. So let's say that you care a lot about how well you do in the negotiation. Are you OK, Lisa? I, I think I'm loving this. <laughs> OK. Let's say you care about a lot about how well you do and you care about how well the other person does. That's the win-win negotiation style. It's also called collaboration. If people do talk about a best style, this is the one everyone gives lip service to, even if they're not actually doing it. It isn't always the best style to use, though. It's great when you've got a lot of time to talk through all the possibilities, and the other party is acting in good faith. It'll get you in trouble if you try to collaborate when there isn't much time, or the other party just doesn't want to collaborate. So even though it's the style that sounds the most virtuous and gets the most airplay, sometimes it's just stupid. That said, how many of you have been told we need to collaborate more? Yeah, a lot of people have heard that. Hold that thought. I'll be coming back to it. If you want to do well and either don't care about the other party or actually want them to do badly, that's the competitive win-lose style. Um, not everybody is like Alec Baldwin and Glenn, Gary, Glenn Ross. And sometimes it's the best tool for the job. When you don't need to interact with the other party again, when you do need to interact, but they're really competitive and you need to fight back, it's less likely to be the right tool when you need to maintain a good relationship with somebody. If you're kind of middling on both axes, you get the compromising style. You win some, you lose some. They win some, and they lose some. My negotiation teacher called this splitting the baby, as in the song as in the uh, Bible story. He didn't like it. He thought that it was a cop-out, but sometimes it's the best thing. When you need something quickly, or it's not that important and not worth the effort of collaboration, the problem is when you use it because it seems fair, but really you haven't prepared enough to know what's really important. You risk compromising on the things that matter because you haven't figured them out. And basically, whoever starts with the most extreme position in a compromise, they win, because when they meet in the middle, that middle is closer to their side. If you would rather not deal with conflict altogether, you're being neither assertive nor cooperative, you are avoiding. That's not necessarily bad. Sometimes the only winning move is not to play. People always think of diplomats, diplomats as great negotiators. They're usually not. Usually, they're really, really great avoiders. There's, that's from the research. Um, you might not be prepared, the risk might be too high, or the stakes might be too low. Avoiding can be good. It can also be really, really bad and cause resentment and miscommunication to build up. And finally, if you are okay with losing, as long as the other person is happy, that's the accommodating style. When you're accommodating, you're focused on preserving the relationship above all else. This is actually a good idea sometimes. When you're in the wrong, if you're going to lose, it might as well do it graciously. Um, if you don't actually care about the issue, throw them a bone. It's obviously a bad idea to be accommodating over in really important issues or when you're dealing with highly competitive folks. Accommodators can end up giving away the farm before they even know what it's worth to the other party. <coughs> Excuse me. There are a bunch of tests that are supposed to assess our preferences. They're kind of like Myers-Briggs if you've taken that. It's corporate astrology. <laughs> but I found it pretty useful for understanding why other people are so weird and found... <laughs> I, look, I am the rarest Myers-Briggs type out there, okay? Everybody is an alien, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and the style preferences test can help do the same thing with negotiation. And it did, in fact, explain why I was screwing up. So what I did was I asked a bunch of American information security professionals to take the Thomas Kilman conflict mode instrument. Um, one third of my sample came from CIRA. Lucky for me, the test is already normed against the US workforce. So I didn't have to deal with control groups or anything. I just used the test norms. That was my control. To be honest, I figured that I would get the null hypothesis. There we go. Um, most research isn't interesting. I just wanted to get my degree and run. <coughs> I 
I didn't think there was really going to be any difference between us and everybody else. But hey, at least I could prove it, right? Wrong. With my sample of 45 people, my vast sample of 45 people, I had a statistically significant result. I know that a lot of people here don't like frequent statistics. This was before I'd even heard about CIRA, and that's all I knew how to do. So deal with it, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, why can't we have nice things? According to my study, anyway. We are less accommodating than the norm. This wasn't a significant but trivial sort of difference either. The effect size was actually decent. The median for my sample was a 30th percentile. The mode was a 16th percentile. I'm, I'm with the 16th percentiles down, down there. That's why I kept not being able to make deals. So what does it mean that we're less accommodating? It means that we've got a really low supply of one of the basic tools of negotiation. It means that everything looks like rivets or screws or staples, even though sometimes it's nails. There were, of course, a few people who were normal to high accommodators. You know, you can see the 11 out there. And it's just that our tendency, at least in my sample, was to say, hell no. And if you think of it, that makes sense. A lot of our job is, fr is framed as saying, hell no, to people. I didn't study why I got these results, but I'm guessing that our field selects for people who are willing and able to say no over and over and over, and yet be over four years old. <laughs> now, every other negotiation preference was basically the same as a general population. We're equally collaborative, competitive, compromising, and avoiding. This doesn't mean that individuals can't be pretty wacky, just that the wackiness is evenly distributed. It's only in the accommodating prefer preference that doesn't work right. This is important because all that stuff about how we need to collaborate more is kind of a red herring. We do collaborate just as much or as little as everybody else. We need to collaborate more, sure, but so does everybody else. We're not specially uncollaborative here. Um, you know, telling us to collaborate more is not helpful. And you know, I statistically proved it, right? You know, as much as my little study does. Um, that was actually the uh, highest p-value I got in my study for differences for the norm. You know, 50% that that's chance. The problem is, other people can't tell that we are um, willing to collaborate. One of the ways you signal a willingness to collaborate with someone is you accommodate a little sometimes. We don't. So since they think we're, they're not, we are not collaborating, they don't collaborate either. Even if a collaborative negotiation starts, we can stop it in its tracks by not giving on anything ever. I'm not advocating that we become accommodators. That way lies madness. But we can make sure we're not giving the incorrect impression that we refuse to negotiate anything ever. Now, one of the reasons that I was a low accommodator is I have this had, no, I still have it, um, had this really stupid idea that being nice to people was somehow being manipulative and evil. And so I was afraid that you know, if I did this social influence stuff, um, this was somehow cheating. The actual argument gets kind of philosophical, and it's beyond the scope of my talk, but I do want to make two suggestions here. First of all, even rational people aren't nearly as rational as we think we are. And the science says that if we were, we'd be pretty non-functional. So um, all these cold, hard facts that we, or at least I, prize so much are another method of social influence. And secondly, would you rather be right or would you rather get things done? Being right in $5 will get you a cup of coffee now. Um, this particular book is a book on remedial office politics. I loved it when I was in school. I loaned it to my best friend. He said, it's great, but it's about three times longer than it needed to be. Um, but he couldn't think of anything else that was similar. So I do recommend this particular book 
for you. Um, if you're anything like me, having it be three times longer just means that you get hit by the two by four more often and it helps it sink in. So <coughs> how do we do this? Look for nails. Look for ways to influence people socially and look for stuff to accommodate on even if it doesn't matter. Bring the donuts. This actually works. I'm serious. It's not that you're bribing people exactly. I mean, you are, but what's really happening is that there's this implied negotiation that you've accommodated on. That means you're willing to deal, right? Just bring the frickin' donuts. Allie knows this. <laughs> I took her to donuts before the last Eurocon, and she brought a bunch. This signals a willingness to collaborate. Another thing that gets a lot of mileage is to look for when you're wrong about something and then admit it. I don't mean being deliberately wrong about something, you know, unless you're perfect, it'll happen naturally on its own. But admit it, don't try to hide it. You know, if you're very frank and open about it, people think, wow, you're kind of a grown up. And um, admitting being wrong seems like a concession, even though it basically isn't, because the truth is, you actually did screw up. And that's one thing where the whole you know, right way to do thing actually can actually work in your favor. The right way to do thing is just to admit stuff, apologize for it, and move on, as opposed to trying to hide it the way, you know, our natural reflex is. Telling someone you're right works really, really, really well, even when they already are right. Okay. Everyone tells you to pick which battles you try to win. That's true. What I was saying was also pick battles that, to lose. Because, you know, if you are like this and you have trouble accommodating, you need to look for things to, to accommodate on because you're just not going to do it the way normal people do and just part of the give and take. So pick an, make an effort to pick battles you don't mind losing and lose them graciously. And you do need to pick what battles you really fight for, too. How many security professionals have picked passwords as their hill to die on? How many people still pick passwords as their hill to die on? How much research is there that passwords actually kind of suck a lot? That a lot of the things that we do for passwords are not actually all that helpful? A lot of things get turned into dogma, and we don't even know why. Does anybody know why so many password policies want three out of four character types, uppercase, lowercase, special characters, and numbers? My understanding is that this is a default password, strong password filter for Active Directory. If you want something else, you need to make another filter, which means you need professional services. That's why. It's not like somebody sat there and figured out the entropy. And in fact, if you've got a mainframe that reduces your special character set, that requirement reduces entropy. Interest-based negotiation is another strategy. It is what most people are talking about when they talk about collaboration. The idea is that you need to talk about your interests and find out what you really want to need and then find out what the possibilities are. The idea is that you talk about what you actually are interested, what you actually need, and find more value. The classic example is, you know, a couple people are fighting over oranges, they divide the oranges evenly, and one of them uses the juice and the other one uses the zest. They could have all had all the oranges because the, par the part they were interested in was not actually the same. So that's what they call expanding the pie. The problem with expanding the pie um, you still have to divide it up afterwards. That's why it's good to have someone who is good at negotiation later. I mean, good at the competitive style later. It's no good to spend a lot of effort creating more value and then letting the other party have all the extra value. Let's say that your interest is ensuring that passwords for file transfers are encrypted over the network. To that end, you don't want to use FTP or other clear checks protocols. Fair enough, but does it really matter? 
whether people use FTPS, SFTP, connect, the encrypted Connect Direct, manage file transfer, FTP over IPsec. Too often, people in our field decide there is a right answer and will fight to the death for that specific answer, even if there are other answers that would actually be OK. Another thing low accommodation people do when they win, or at least that I do when I win, is I try to make sure that you know that you have not been accommodated. I don't want you getting ideas. If you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. How many of you have heard that? The problem is, that means we're insisting that the other party lose face, as well as losing the negotiation. People can forgive you for winning. They're much less likely to forgive you for making them look bad. It's back to that manipulation thing. We often think it's tricksy and manipulative to let them win. Wins or losses look like anything but wins or losses. But others see it differently. They see it as, you've already won. Why do you have to be a bully about it? <coughs> we also need to work to understand others better. Everyone in information security, I think, needs to read this paper, Cormac Hurley's So Long and No Thanks for the Externalities, The Rational Rejection of Security Advice by Users. Basically, he looks into a lot of things that we tell users they have to do, counts up how much it's going to save them versus how much the threats might actually cost them. And you know the uh, indirect costs for all the stuff, checking URLs, checking certificates, et cetera, far exceed what any of them might expect to pay for fraud loss or anything like that. Let's see, this, up, this applies to business settings as well. I'm not saying that all the security advice is useless, just that we need to be a lot more sensitive to what burdens we are imposing and what the actual value of those burdens would be. Another thing that information security people tend to forget is that we are domain experts in a field that is pretty counterintuitive for others. We can recognize patterns quickly, whether, whereas those not familiar with the field have to think things through step by step. We are just as slow in other fields. I don't know if I could even balance my checkbook anymore without Quicken. <coughs> we forget that the security stuff doesn't come naturally to others and get frustrated with them when they don't get the obvious. The problem is, it's not their job to get the obvious. It's our job to get it so they don't have to. This is what Daniel Kahneman is talking about in Thinking Fast and Slow. System one is that fast, intuitive comprehension of an idea. It can be fast through heuristics, which are mental shortcuts that everyone uses, which may or may not reflect reality very well. It can also be fast through real expertise, which, you know, after you've been sitting around reading a million security blogs and playing with your computer or doing whatever, you start having this expertise about security. You get it. System two is deliberate, rational, logical thought. It's how I can figure out base rate probabilities if I draw the table, but I can't get them with thinking it through. The thing is, system two is expensive. Our brains don't like to use it. They put in sneaky little shortcuts to make it so we don't have to. If you don't have expertise in an area, you're going to use these shortcuts, and sometimes you still get it wrong. Anything that relies on people using system two all the time is going to fail and fail badly. Saying that people ought to use system two works about as well as telling me that I ought to have better social skills. This is important in a couple of ways. One of them is that people just don't base decisions on system two thinking. Gary Klein, I should have stayed back there, does a lot of research with experts who have to think fast. Firefighters, nurses, military commanders, they're not following the laborious system two decision theory processes that, that are talked about in decision science. They've instead invested hundreds or thousands of hours gaining the experience and expertise to instantly recognize the real patterns and cut through the noise to the signal. The power of intuition is about how people do this and about how to learn to do it faster. People who haven't spent hundreds or thousands of hours learning to understand the patterns and security issues, use the system on heuristics. If you want to understand what people are thinking better, it helps to read Wash's folk models of home computer security. The problem is not that the models are wrong. 
All models are wrong, but some are useful. It's that they're incomplete and sometimes result in poor decisions. It's also that we keep trying to improve their models rather than work with the existing models to help them make better decisions. It's not their job to learn our world, world view. Have you ever been told that it is a good idea to let the other person think that they came up with something? I've heard that one a lot. I never had a clue how to do it until I learned about motivational interviewing. Evan Wheeler and his wife, Rachel Friendly, actually gave an awesome presentation on this at the very first Syracon. You know, if you missed it, sorry, it, it is online. Motivational interviewing was developed as a way to help people with substance abuse pro problems find intrinsic motivation for change. It uses a lot of open-ended questions to get at what people really think of a proposed change. This kind of information is super important if you're trying to get people to change. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't include the way I actually learned how to have better social skills. <laughs> For real. And no, it may not seem like it, but I promise my social skills are way better than they were five years ago. Jay can probably tell you that. <laughs> and um, the thing that helped me do this actually didn't have much to do with social skills. I sort of knew what I was supposed to do. I just kept not being able to do it in the moment. And the things that helped most were regular exercise and regular meditation. And that just sort of gave me the space so that I wouldn't be so reactive, especially when I started getting really low accommodator of me and no, no, no. This helped, helped me step back and say, OK, do I really care about this? I mean, aside from the fact that I like saying no, do I really care? And um, that has helped a lot. Let's see. You personally may or may not be a low accommodator. My research might not hold if we try to replicate it. it certainly looks to me like there are a lot of patterns in our field that match the idea of our having a tendency to, uh, to not accommodate people even when we should try. But this might be confirmation bias on my part, and the cause might be something completely different. But regardless, I hope that you find this a useful way to think about things. Questions? Questions? No. No questions. Am I supposed to say no because we say no? Yes. Yeah, OK. All right. Are there any questions? I'm ready for you. I'll race to you. Oh, there's one. <coughs> uh, based on your skill, professional <laughs> training, certification, and personal growth process, what advice would you have for your fellow professionals to help them better discern when they should stand their ground, like ethical things that go beyond their uh, personal scope uh, <coughs> versus when it's good to yield on things that they may have strong beliefs but may not have larger consequences. In other words, the feeling in the system in their body, it's hard to discern which one to do. Meditation, honestly. <laughs> I mean, it, God, it sounds so woo-woo, and I'm like the least woo-woo person there is, and, um, you know, I have no patience for, for that. But with meditations, you get used to what your brain is like when, you're, when, it's, when it's all there, as opposed to, you know, running out after rabbits or whatever thoughts you're having. Um, you know, I recently had an issue where I learned of something I consider really unethical and, you know, didn't have anything to do with my company, had to do with something else. And I asked a friend of mine, okay, what do I do about this? And I didn't even tell him what it was. And he said, what can you, can you do about it? And, you know, I had a rumor. Essentially, you know, okay, told to me by an architect, but I had a rumor. 
the answer was to, you know, not do anything on the basis that I didn't actually know anything. I mean, yeah, I believe my friend, but, you know, that's not enough to, you know, basically blow up my career, which is what it would have happened. So um, have good people to talk with, you know, which means you have to have good enough social skills to get friends. Um, but I do have a few, you know, and the meditation, the biggest thing with that is it helps you put a space between yourself and your immediate dumbass reaction. I've got a question. <clears throat> Along the way of uh, having all these people do the instrument, did you run into any individuals that completely epitomized the not accommodating uh, behavior? I, I mean, sometimes it's a little hard for me to internalize. I mean, does this really apply to me, or are you just doing some you know, group of people that I can't relate to? Well, I was in the 16th percentile, and I pretty much epitomized the non-accommodating thing. You know, I call it the cut off your nose to spite your face orientation. You know, how many of you have seen an information security person do that? Yeah. See, it happens, it, it happens a fair bit. And, you know, um, I actually don't remember anybody else's scores because, you know, it's like I kept them all separate and didn't associate names. And, you know, I think I knew in the first place simply because I was administering the test, but, like, all that data is gone. But, you know, I have run into people. I'm like, yeah, you're a little, con you, you're, you're just not an accommodator at all, are you? You know. Anybody else? Al? Oh, good. <coughs> Rachel, in some of our professions, we kind of get non-accommodators and non-accommodators working, trying to come to some type of a resolution. Any thoughts on that? I'm Steel cage death and security ranch. people. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm joking. That's really hard because you've got, you know, the literature will say that low accommodators are good in the negotiation when you need to come to the objectively right answer because that's what we tend to go for is we tend to go for the objectively right answer. Um, it's a problem when you actually need to come to a conclusion a reasonable amount of time. If you've got two people who are low accommodators, um, if you are one of them, honestly, you just need to bite the bullet and, and you know, make yourself accommodate. That's, that's where I come from with the admitting where I'm wrong about stuff. You know, I get a lot of mileage out of that, you know, because it's like, yeah, I'm going to be wrong sometimes anyway. If I'm never wrong, that means I'm not trying hard enough. Seriously, it, it really does. And so if, if I admit it, then other people are like, oh, OK, you're more accommodating. Even low accommodators are going to be more accommodating if the other person sort of like models it for them sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes it just ain't happening. Um, if you're aware that someone is being a low accommodator, you can often talk, go to the interest-based negotiation stuff and talk about actual interests and get them, try to get them away from this position they've taken that is so clearly so very, very wrong. Thank so. you. <coughs> I'm just looking. Anybody else? I, I just had one quick, I, I couldn't remember when you were describing when you did the research versus when you got that um, negotiation and um, the thing you said you're really bad at, which order did that go in and did those two things have any influence on each other? Like you did the research and then went, oh, I'm going to go do this or vice versa. Um, I got the qualification for being a mediator and an arbitrator for Minnesota um, as part of my grad school and then the research was the final project for grad school that I needed to do to graduate. 
So that, that, that's what the relationship is. I did all this at the Hamlin School of Law um, Dispute Resolution Institute. My grad degree was, it was a joint program with St. Kate's, but I really loved the Hamlin School of Law part of this. It was far, far, it was just the best school experience I had because it was so interesting and so new. Um, actually, the Hamline School of Law Dispute Resolution Program is listed as like one of the top schools for that in the nation. You know, Harvard, Pepperdine, Hamlin, what? <laughs> so um, one of those things is not like the others. So it's, it's really a very cool program. If you're local, I do recommend checking it out. Um, start with the negotiation class, if you do. Thank you. Oh, here's another question. <clears throat> you, you've reminded me of something. I spent a lot of the summer, by luck of the draw, hanging out with lawyers. Uh, including one of my kids who's a lawyer. And it occurs to me, and I've heard um, several information security friendly lawyers say InfoSec people need to leverage uh, <coughs> relationships with their general counsel's office. And I'd like to get your input on that. Can you repeat? I was coughing. <laughs> yeah. So the, the question is, or the, the, the advice was, uh, InfoSec people, at least at a certain level, would do well to leverage relationships with their counsel's office. What do you think about that? I think that legal has a very, very big stick, and you know, if we're not trying to use it, especially if we're in a highly regulated industry, if we're not trying to work with legal to use that very big legal stick, we're crazy. That's what I think. You know. Um, The, le the, the legal requirements for our field, you know, it varies on what industry you're in and, and stuff like that. But often, legal is one of the few voices that the, that the uh, C office will listen to, especially if you've historically been the kind of disconnected, low accommodating information security department in the past. All right, I have one more too. Um, do you make that paper that you wrote available for people? I've never um, written it up as a paper. Oh, well, okay. it was my, it was a final project. Okay. Um, one of the things that I probably need to do is figure out how to get it, you know, read it up and submitted to some sort of peer reviewed journal or whatever. And if somebody knows how to do that and <laughs> wants to tell me, that'd be really cool. Yeah. <laughs> does. Yeah. yeah. All right, last call. Did Jack have a question? Okay, you were just waving. All right. Well, Rachel, this is definitely one of the most humor-infused presentations. You had me going kind of nuts up there. So thank you for that, and thank you for presenting something so you know personal and introspective. It was a really refreshing presentation. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you.